Hi all, Dr. Clark here again. Uh, today for general biology, we're going to look at how DNA self-replicates. Self right, so what we're going to examine is the process by which DNA copies itself and kind of the uh, history that or the studies that were used to figure this out. And so if you remember back last lecture, we're talking about the structure of DNA. And so the work by Rosalind Franklin, Maurice Wilkins, Watson and Crick and Erwin Chargoff and all these other biologists that uh, helped figure out what the structure of DNA was. Now, the next step in DNA was to figure out, okay, we know it's double helix, but how does it replicate? And through a bunch of experiments, that I'll talk about one main one, um, the Messel and Stahl experiment, we figured out that DNA um, replicates in what we call a semi-conservative method. So <clears throat> this is kind of a general diagram of DNA replicating. The first piece of DNA replica replication is topoisomerase, which this enzyme its job is to unwind DNA. So it makes it go from being double helix to linear, straight lines. Then another enzyme called helicase comes in and it breaks the hydrogen bonds between the nitrogenous bases. So remember, um, adenine and thymine have two hydrogen bonds, and guanine and cytosine have three hydrogen bonds. So <coughs> helicase's job is to break that down. Now, where that occurs, where helicase is occurring at and breaking bonds, is what we call the replication fork. And because DNA is anti-parallel, so it runs one line of DNA runs five prime to three prime, and the other strand of DNA runs three prime to five prime, we need to build a new chunk of DNA or copy the DNA in two directions. Okay. One which we call the leading strand and it's built continuously. Okay. DNA polymerase is laying down new nucleotides off of the old ones. Okay. You gotta have some primers and primase to lay down a starting point. And we'll talk more about this. You have these single stranded binding proteins which causes the DNA to not be able to bind back to itself. And so this leading strand is formed. Now what you're not seeing over here is the lagging strand being formed. And so what you would need to do is because helicase is moving in this direction, you would have to add primers on. And as helicase unwinds, or as topoisomase unwinds more and helicase breaks more bonds, you have to add another primer. And so DNA on the lagging strand is built in the opposite direction, okay, away from the replication fork, which causes it to be built in little teeny fragments. Those fragments are called Okazaki fragments. Okay. We're going to come back and we'll talk a lot more about this entire process after we visit kind of the history of how we figured some of these pieces out. All right, so first off, we knew that DNA was double helix from the work of previous scientists and we knew that the strands were anti-parallel to each other. And from that we had to figure out well is DNA uh, kind of a hodgepodge when it copies itself? Does it copy small segments of itself? Do, do you just take the old strand and make a new strand off of it, or is it part old strand, part new strand? <clears throat> now, it was Francis Crick's idea about how DNA replicates itself, or the unzipping of DNA, that kind of started this research. He didn't actually do all this research by himself, but after discovering the structure of DNA, he, you know, he contributed quite a bit to the ideas of how DNA could copy itself, and that's by you know complementary base pairs, unzipping, and forming new strands. So 
for a long time, the, there was a hypothesis that DNA would replicate itself um, one of these three mechanisms. Either it's going to be a conservative replication where a new strand is built off of an old strand, but then those two new strands would come together and form a new strand of DNA and you'd have an old strand of DNA. Semi-conservative, where those new strand and old strands just stick together, there's no recombination afterwards. And then disruptive or dispersive replication, where little chunks of each one um, are interchanged. So you get this kind of mixing of the DNA after it copies itself. New and old mixing. Okay, It's the same genetic code, so it, there's no difference in the DNA. It's just new and old. So Math Matthew Messelson and Franklin Stahl, or Methelson and Stahl, which they're normally known for because of the hypothesis um, that they devised and the research that they designed, uh, resided on, they were testing these three alternative hypotheses for the replication of DNA. In order to do that, much like when we were testing whether or not DNA was the uh, material of genes or proteins, they took a similar approach. They used radioactive isotopes. Okay, this time they used a radioactive isotope of nitrogen, okay, which you would find in the nitrogenous bases. And they introduced these radioactive isotopes of nitrogen at different stages of replication to try to figure out if you know the DNA was replicating um, disruptive or dispersive, semi-conservative or conservative. They found that DNA replicated semi-conservative. So the strand splits, new strand built on both old strands, and then they reform. Okay? There's no recombination. There's no twisting of material um, of old and new. You just have one old strand bound to a new strand, a template. Okay? To figure that out, they use heavy nitrogen and bacteria and they grew bacteria on heavy nitrogen and then um, they grew it on nitrogen 14 also. You're going to watch a little video about this but it's really similar to Griffin's work with um, bacteriophages and um, Sutton's work on bacteriophages and, and it's really getting at the same premise except for now they're using a little bit more advanced techniques because science has progressed a little bit. The Messelson and Stahl experiment provides evidence for semi-conservative replication of the DNA molecule where the two parent strands serve as the template for synthesis of new strands. In this experiment, bacterial cells were grown for several generations on a medium containing a heavy isotope of nitrogen, N15. The DNA in these cells therefore contained heavy N15 nitrogen. The cells were then transferred to a new medium containing the normal lighter isotope N14. At various times after the transfer, samples of the bacteria were collected. The DNA was then extracted and dissolved in a solution of cesium chloride. The samples were then spun rapidly in a centrifuge. When the cesium chloride is centrifuged at high speed, a concentration gradient is established in the tube. DNA molecules move in the gradient until they reach a place where their density equals that of the cesium. DNA containing N14 move to a position in the gradient determined by its density. DNA containing N15 is denser than that containing N14, so it sank to a lower position in the cesium gradient. After one generation in N14 medium, the bacteria yielded a single band of DNA with a density between that of N14 DNA and N15 DNA, indicating that only one strand of each duplex contained N15. After two generations in N14 medium, two bands were obtained, one of intermediate density, in which one of the strands contained N15, and one of low density, in which neither strand contained N15.
Messelson and Stahl concluded that replication of the DNA duplex involves building new molecules by separating parent strands and then adding new nucleotides to form the complementary strand on each of these templates. <clears throat> okay, so there you can see Messelson and Stahl's experiment. Um, like I said before, it's fairly similar to some of the other experiments that were used to determine that DNA was indeed the uh, material for genes. Uh, but here you can see that by using a simple centrifuge method that you can figure out um, that indeed that the DNA copies itself semi-conservatively, meaning that after a few generations you still will have N15 but you're not going to have pure N15 in solution any longer because um, it's an old strand with a new strand. Okay? And so that's the interesting piece. If this was conservative, then you would expect to see N15 continuously throughout the entire experiment. If this was something like a dispersive, then you might see a, a equal mix throughout the material, or most of the bands would just sit in the middle because they'd both be heavy and light. Okay? All right. <clears throat> so when we talk about DNA replication, we need to talk about the enzymes involved with DNA replication. Remember back when we were talking about DNA and the formation of chromosomes, and I said that chromosomes are, are always adjacent to different proteins, in the case of histones and things like that, but they also are in, incorporate uh, RNA, and they also incorporate specialized enzymes that help with replication because replication can be a, have to be triggered immediately in some cases and you don't need to the body is not going to wait for those enzymes to flow to the system they are already associated with those enzymes and it's the trigger that changes whether or not they're going to accept those enzymes and go through replication so the first enzyme that's important is DNA polymerase. Now there are three types of DNA polymerase, one, two, and three. And their job mainly is to add nucleotides. Okay, so they're going to add nucleotides to any, a pre-existing strand. Now here's the key thing about DNA polymerase, or about DNA replication in general, is only new nucleotides can only be added to the three prime end of the DNA. So if you remember from back when we were talking about the structure of DNA and I said DNA has five main carbons and they're labeled primes. So the first carbon, uh, one prime, is where the nitrogenous base is attached to. The second carbon is what distinguishes whether it is a ribose sugar or a deoxyribose sugar. And so if it has an OH group there, it's a ribose sugar. If it has a hydrogen there, it's a deoxyribose sugar. The third prime is the building end. This is where the OH group can be removed and you can bind a phosphate to it from another nucleotide. And then the four and the five, um, well the four you don't build anything off of, the five has what we call a phosphorus cap. Okay, so nothing can build, be built off the five prime end. So you're always going to be removing material, um, having a dehydration reaction. You're going to be removing hydroxide and adding a new nucleotide from the three prime end. Okay. The other piece is you have to break the existing bonds. So the bonds between the nitrogenous bases are hydrogen bonds and there's a special enzyme called helicase that will break down those hydrogen bonds which will separate the two strands and creates a replication fork. DNA ligase on the other hand it can seal fragments within the DNA so if there's a little breakage between two strands of DNA it'll come in and it will mend that breakage. It'll form a bond between those two. This is really important and um, life wouldn't exist without it in the sense that it's the only way 
that the lagging strand can form is in fragments which are then sealed by DNA ligase. So here you can just see kind of exactly what I was trying to explain to you about the primes. So there's carbon number one, two, three, okay. Um, there's an OH group off carbon number three. The phosphate will come in, remove the OH, okay? and two phosphates will be released into solution and you'll form a bond. Now this is a complementary nucleotide because in this case adenine are, is going to bond to thymine. So thymine will bond to adenine with double hydrogen bonds and then there will be a phosphodiester bond between the three prime sugar or that carbon and that phosphate. And it will just keep building and building and building. It's the job of DNA polymerase 3 to do this. Okay, add new nucleotides to a growing strand. Now, DNA, I think I said this a long time ago, DNA cannot copy itself without the help of RNA. This gives us a lot of evidence of that DNA probably came, evolved after RNA. That DNA was not the first molecule that RNA was the first information molecule or something related to RNA because RNA can replicate itself but DNA on the other hand cannot replicate itself without the addition of what we call a primer okay? and so that primer is an RNA and it's laid down by RNA primase okay? that primer is an RNA strand that DNA polymerase 3 can attach to Okay, and we'll look at this again. Okay. Now, if DNA polymerase attaches to the primer and starts adding nucleotides in a continuous fashion, so one big line, we call that the leading strand. The opposite side cannot be built in a continuous fashion, so it has to be built with little teeny fragments, so you have to add a lot more primers, so RNA um, Primase is much more busy on the lagging strand and it's adding primers and then DNA polymerase can come in and attach to it and build little teeny fragments. Okay. So one strand that's continuous is the leading strand and the other strand which is built in fragments is called the lagging strand. Those fragments are called Okazaki fragments named after the pair of biologists that discovered them. Ligase is the enzyme that joins those Okazaki fragments together. Okay, now you're going to watch a little video about DNA replication. Okay, It's not going to go into great detail um, about the replication, but it's just going to kind of give you an overview of how this happens. Then we'll go into much greater detail with the different enzymes and um, the, the role that some other things play in the replication of your DNA. DNA replication begins at a specific point in the DNA molecule called the origin of replication site. Initially, the enzyme helicase unwinds and separates a portion of the DNA molecule after which single-strand binding proteins react with and stabilize the separated single-stranded sections of the DNA molecule. The enzyme complex DNA polymerase engages the separated portion of the molecule and initiates the process of replication. DNA polymerase can only add new DNA nucleotides to a pre-existing chain of nucleotides. Therefore, replication begins as an enzyme called primase assembles an RNA primer at the origin of replication site. The RNA primer consists of a short sequence of RNA nucleotides, complementary to a small initial section of the DNA strand being prepared for replication. DNA polymerase is then able to add DNA nucleotides to the RNA primer and thus begin the process of constructing a new complementary strand of DNA. Later, the RNA primer is enzymatically removed and replaced with an appropriate sequence of DNA nucleotides.
Because the two complementary strands of the DNA molecule are oriented in opposite directions and the DNA polymerase can only accommodate replication in one direction, two different mechanisms for copying the strands of DNA are employed. One strand is replicated continuously toward the unwinding, separating portion of the original DNA molecule, while the other strand is replicated discontinuously in the opposite direction with the formation of a series of short DNA segments called Okazaki fragments. Each Okazaki fragment requires a separate RNA primer. As the Okazaki fragments are synthesized, the RNA primers are enzymatically replaced with the appropriate DNA nucleotides, and the individual Okazaki fragments are then bonded together into a continuous complementary strand. Okay, so there you can see just kind of an overview of how this happens. Right? They're introducing some uh, single-strand binding proteins here. Polymerase 3, this little guy that keeps removing that RNA, RNA primer, it's called DNA polymerase 1. A ligase comes in, fixes it. Uh, um, helicase is shown there. Uh, so most of the enzymes that we're interested in are, are shown, but uh, there's a lot more detail to this, and, and we'll uh, dredge through that in, in just a second. So... <clears throat> Now, again, when DNA is copying itself, to begin the leading strand, you must lay down an RNA primer. And then for the lagging strand, you must lay down a bunch of RNA primers. These all have to be removed. You cannot have RNA in your DNA molecule. So you have to be able to remove these, and it is polymerase 1 that does that. Now, after they've been removed, you're going to have a little segment that doesn't have a phosphodiester bond. So DNA ligase is going to form that phosphodiester bond, that bond between phosphate group and the sugar, which is sometimes just called an ester bond. Okay, so here, see it again? Single-stranded binding proteins, after helicase comes through and starts breaking the hydrogen bonds, these will come in and they will keep the replication fork open. They'll keep the two strands from going back and um, wrapping them back around each other. Okay. As helicase is moving in one direction, the same direction that helicase is moving is the direction that the leading strand is moving. Primase lays a primer down, DNA polymerase 3 starts laying down new nucleotides. That primase or that primer is removed by DNA polymerase 1, and, and then ligase comes in and fixes the gap. Now, the lagging strand, on the other hand, is built in the opposite direction of the replication fork. Helicase is moving this direction, but these, these uh, Okazaki fragments and the formation is moving in this direction. So you have a bunch more fragments, a lot more primers laid down, and you have to use a lot more ligase to bind these together. But nonetheless, it works. It's not super efficient, um, but uh, for the most part, it's productive, and you as an organism that does this on a day-to-day -day basis are pretty good at it. DNA replication begins when helicase unwinds a segment of the DNA and breaks the hydrogen bonds between the two complementary strands of DNA. DNA polymerase can only add new nucleotides to a free 3' prime end of a growing chain. Synthesis of one strand of the DNA, called the leading strand, proceeds continuously in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction. Synthesis of the complementary strand, called the lagging strand, is more complex. DNA polymerase can add new deoxyribonucleotides only to a free 3' prime OH. To provide a free 3' prime OH starting point on the lagging strand, RNA primase attaches to the DNA and synthesizes a short RNA primer. DNA polymerase 3 then adds deoxyribonucleotides to the 3' end of the RNA primer.
DNA polymerase 1 replaces DNA polymerase 3, removes the RNA, and replaces it with DNA. Finally, the enzyme DNA ligase forms a phosphodiester bond between the 3' OH of the growing strand and the 5' phosphate in front of it. During DNA replication, the leading strand is synthesized continuously, while the lagging strand is synthesized discontinuously. Okay, so there you can see just a general overview of the entire thing. Now, a couple things to keep in mind, that when this is occurring, it occurs at different times um, in your life, and different cells have the capabilities of doing this. Things like nerve cells never really go through this and because they are stuck in the geo phase, so they never make it to the synthesis phase. But this is what's going on in the synthesis phase, or the S phase, of the cell cycle. And remember that even though there is an a origin of replication on each chromosome, every single chromosome and every single base pair is copied. Okay? So it's complete copying of the genome of that organism. Okay? So all the chromosomes, all if we're talking about humans, all 23 chromosomes are copied during the S phase in this manner. That's important because of this last piece, this ligase piece and, and um, that primer. Remember when we were talking about the Hayflick limit? We said that every time your chromosomes copy themselves, a little bit of the telomere cap is removed. Well, what these videos are not showing you is at the very end of these chromosomes, of these long strands of DNA, at the very end, an RNA primer will be laid down, but it's not going to incorporate the last little bit of the DNA. Depending on the organism, how much that is really, you know, depends on the life cycle of that organism. Some organisms that live for a very long time, it's going to incorporate most of the DNA and very little is going to be removed. Some organisms that don't live very long at all, it, a lot more is removed each time they replicate. But at any rate, it's that RNA primer and the fact that it cannot bind to the very tip of the lagging strand that causes us to age and causes us to go through the Hayflick limit. Now this is of interest to us because some people have tried to devise ways at which the prime, you could get primase to do that. Recognize the very end of the DNA and put the primer there. Um, this is yet to be done, uh, but nonetheless, if you can do that and reduce the amount of DNA that's being removed every replication, could probably, in essence, increase the lifespan of people. Okay, or for that matter, whatever organism you're interested in. Okay, <clears throat> so occasionally, and I shouldn't say occasionally, because it happens more often um, than you would expect, DNA is copying that entire genome. For, for us, that's three billion base pairs. So it's copying that 3 billion base pairs, and occasionally it makes a mistake. Okay? Occasionally an error pops up. Okay? We have a series of enzymes, and we've talked about this before, like P53, P21. There is a series of enzymes that can repair or detect damage or mistaken uh, DNA bonds okay, along the DNA strand. So right after the DNA has been copied, a lot of times it'll be checked to see if um, there's some mispairing going on or you know uh, some kind of mutation. But just like our proofreading system, just like a proofreading system on you know like a Word document or your proofreading system on a text message, it's not perfect. And when you're dealing with three billion base pairs and you're dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis, you're going to probably make mistakes. Now, those mistakes will often happen in regions of the 
genetic or in the genome that are not coding for information. It's not coding for anything, any gene. Okay? And that's what we call the intron region. And so of your 3 billion base pairs, your intron region is roughly 70%. So 70% of your DNA doesn't code for anything. And so often you'll get mutations that occur in the intron region. And it doesn't, it doesn't really do anything unless you get certain types of mutations, like deletions or addition mutations. But if it's just changing the reading code, it doesn't do anything to the individual. Okay, and we'll look at mutations next time. And we'll go into not just DNA mutations, okay, but also chromosomal mutations. Okay, so with that, mutations, next lecture.